Uh, I Good, it's relieving. I had just just a message you in case um, the fixed line numbers were correct or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was and checking them, so they, they're correct in the case uh, you dropped the line. Okay, so I think Thank we can you. start. Welcome back, everybody. So we are starting with the, this panel, and I'll give the floor directly to Dimitra Stefan Stefanatu. And she's a senior legal counsel at Artus Legal. So, Dimitra, the floor is directly yours. And welcome also to the panel from my side. It just me or I, I... Yeah, you're, you're muted now, um, Dimitra. Okay, yes. I have a sound return. Antonio, I I have a return of sound. Um, I, I suppose you can hear. Okay, I see you have stopped. Apparently, you can hear me. Um, I would like to uh, good afternoon once again. I would like to welcome you all in this uh, in this session on the code of engagement uh, for a Concordia threat intelligent um, platform. For this discussion, we have the pleasure. No, I'm not muted. Uh, okay. No, no, we can hear you. Don't worry. I was just saying, like, uh, if we if you're not talking, just mute your mic so that uh, we don't have the echo in the other uh, participants. Okay, just uh, a couple of minutes of delay. This is the, the beauty of live event, and also like uh, the the. We course. all know the pain of this kind of remote events. <laughs> this is the curse of remote event. I was going to say that actually. So just uh, a couple of minutes that uh, Dimitra is reconnecting. So. Just saying, like, just mute yourself if you're not talking so that we don't have sounds return. Meanwhile, people are, are connected on the stage. I can see them. I would just remind everybody that you have both the live chat and the question and answer tab you can use in order to interact with the, our panelists. And uh, again, I hope you enjoy during the lunch break the uh, virtual lounges and the exposition area. I will going to keep them open for the whole day. So even after the demo that is going to be after this panel, you can go and join. So Dimitri is back. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. The oh, game. Okay. Uh, once again, good afternoon.
Okay, I believe it will be quite challenging. Um, the there is a, a, a sound delay. Again, okay, I'm going to to try uh, once again. So good afternoon. Uh, I would like to, to welcome you all once again in this session of Code of Engagement for Concordia Threat Intelligence uh, Platform. For this discussion, we have the pleasure to have with us Marco Caselli, senior key expert at Siemens. Marco has extensively worked uh, with one of the components of Concordia Threat Intelligence Platform, MISP, and he has been one of the main contributors to the code of, of engagement we're going to discuss later on today. We also have the pleasure to have with us Christian Okay, Principal Researcher at DFN CERT. Christian has been extensively involved uh, in, in the No, Dimitri, you have to get the mic close to you, otherwise we lost sound. Dimitra, we, we are not hearing from you. Sorry. We cannot hear anything from you. We see that you put the slides on, but we cannot hear from you. You have to... to... Yeah, she got rid of the headphones. Yeah, probably you have to use the microphone on your headphone. Because uh, you, when you remove the headphones, you were not uh, working anymore. And now you're muted. Do you have the audio from the from the stream from the website still on? It looks like this on your screen. That's maybe the duplicate audio that you hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, probably Christian is right. Close the Teams, um, the Teams uh, tabs. I see you have the stage open uh, on yeah the first tab, tab. You can close it, or just mute the screen there. That should work as well. Exactly. No, no, you were doing. Yeah, if you you can close the stages here on the on the team or the Chrome, you can close it. Just use like WebEx. Now, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hope it lasts. Uh, apologies once again for this. Um, so, uh, I was sharing with you certain slides, uh, perhaps to, to mitigate risk. Um, I will not do it as we speak and I'll just uh, browse through them um, uh, briefly. So, um, in this afternoon session, what I would like us to go through, of course, with the great support of our panelists, um, 
is first of all uh, to see how the threat lands, which are the latest uh, developments with respect to the cybersecurity sea that took place over the last one year and, and onwards, both from a regulatory and policy point of view at EU level. Then we're going to discuss with Marco, who has been extensively involved on the, on the MIS component, uh, on the opportunities and challenges in relation to data sharing, again, from the point of, of work conducted within Concordia and with the question furthermore on the related opportunities and challenging in relation to the incident clearing uh, clearing house. We are going to uh, to share with you which are were the steps that as of the initial phase of the code of engagement up to the version that we uh, uh, are at this point uh, and uh, which, which is where we are we exactly at, which is the state of play of the code of engagement, and which are the, the potential uh, next steps and the afterlife, uh, allow me to put it so, with respect to this dynamic code of engagement, uh, even after the end of Concordia project that ends uh, uh, next year. And of course, at the end of this discussion, we will be happy or even throughout uh, to receive any feedback from the audience, including, of course, uh, questions and answers that will be valuable for us for the uh, for the upcoming uh, versions of the code of engagement. So coming back to uh, my initial point, what has happened in terms of policy and regulatory developments over the, uh, the last one year? A uh, European regulator has taken a series of, of initiatives uh, that uh, either lead to uh, new proposed regulations, such as the Digital Governance Act, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Market Regulation, um, or it has, uh, and, and on top of that, has announced the strengthening of already uh, uh, taken initiatives, uh, such as the EU Cyber uh, Diplomacy Toolbox and the strengthening of the role of security operations centers. Uh, there are also interesting, um, uh, two additional uh, uh, proposed regulations that I would like to, to, to draw your attention at, and this is very much relevant for today's discussion. And this is the review of the NIST directive of the security, the directive of the security of networks and information systems. So the, the NIST one, uh, allow me to put it that way, is being reviewed and the updated version of NIST currently discussed between the uh, EU institutions will broad the scope of the initial uh, of the initial uh, NIST directive. And it will, it is aimed that it covers other sectors, uh, additional sectors, such as food, even uh, postal services or um, uh, chemicals, including public administration. Also, we have um, a form of Lex Specialis, a new uh, proposed regulation when it comes to the digital operational, uh, the so-called DORA, the Digital Operational Resilience Act, that is particularly um, uh, relevant for the financial uh, sector. Uh, by the way, I'm opening a parenthesis here to say that the financial sector is covered by the one of the use cases uh, developed under a Concordia project. So uh, most of these initiatives that I just uh, either policy or regulatory initiatives that uh, I briefly touched upon uh, are, uh, are, are um, sketched and they are touched upon under the EU cybersecurity strategy that was released uh, beginning of uh, mid-December 2020. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the regulatory initiatives are meant to lead to um, horizontally applicable regulations in EU. So they have the form of regulations uh, such as the well-known to you general data protection regulation, meaning that they are meant to apply across all, all, all member member states. States. Uh, uh, to to uh, share with you a couple of um, of points that uh, regarding the status of information sharing in EU, as they were made explicit under the um, the, the the previously mentioned uh, uh, cyber security strategy. So, European Commission uh, explicitly in the in the text of the communication of the EU cyber security strategy states that the EU lacks collective situational awareness on cyber threats. 
Furthermore, it proposes um, a joint uh, cyber unit that will aim to, to focus on operational and technical coordination against cyber uh, incidents. And I'm opening a parenthesis here again to say that this operational and technical coordination are two elements that are taken uh, uh, that are taken into account under the code of engagement that we'll be further uh, discussing later on. F furthermore, this envisioned joint cyber unit that um, is being discussed under the text of the cyber security strategy um, aims at guaranteeing secure and rapid information sharing, improving co uh, cooperation, and establishing strengthening uh, structured partnerships within a, a trusted industry. So this is the, the uh, uh, this is a brief sketch of the status of, inf of the of the status of the information sharing landscape under the EU as it was uh, formulated under the cybersecurity strategy. So this was what, what has been observed that is the case by the European regulator and uh, at Capturing this momentum within Concordia, we've been trying to see how, how we can respond in a proactive manner uh, when it comes to the um, delicacies and the, 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 uh, the sensitivities of information sharing when it comes to the particular domain of, uh, of cyber security. So, um, with that as a brief introduction from my side, I would like to give the floor um, to uh, to, to our uh, panelists, Marco and, uh, and Christian. I would like to start with Marco and I would like to kindly ask you, Marco, to briefly um, share with us a couple of a couple of points regarding Concordia platform, uh, Concordia platform for threat intelligence sharing, because I believe there are in the audience attendants that are not familiar with what the platform does. And, and um, share with us the opportunities and challenges uh, when it comes to uh, data sharing from the point of view uh, of MISP component uh, with which you've been uh, familiar with uh, during the course of Concordia. Thanks, Dimitri. I'll be happy to, to give this introduction. So, uh, First of all, thanks for introducing me. I'll just say a few words. I'm, I've been with Siemens for uh, five years now. I started with the Siemens set in 2017, and uh, uh, that group was uh, basically uh, in charge of protecting Siemens, still in charge of protecting Siemens. Threat intelligence was, of course, a big uh, task within that group. Um, since then, I moved. Uh, more into the research aspects and with Concordia I had again the, the opportunity to further investigate cyber threat intelligence. This is what we are doing together with Christian and uh, uh, with another Christian actually uh, from SIDN in the Netherlands. You will see uh, SIDN in the in the next uh, time slot uh, in the Concordia Open Door event. Um, I would say uh, we, we started Concordia uh, two and a half years ago, and uh, uh, cyber intelligence was always uh, of, of paramount importance within Concordia. So Concordia is about community building, and uh, we have, of course, a big consortium in which a lot of partners are contributing in uh, different aspects of security. Cyber intelligence is one of them. Uh, as, as Dimitri already mentioned, I mean, the, the importance of cyber intelligence is, is uh, clear also from the EU perspective, from national perspective, from company perspective. So uh, it, it's really central for today's cybersecurity. And um, well, since the beginning, we had this, these three partners, I was, I was mentioning Siemens, the FNZ, and then SIDN working on cyber threat intelligence within Concordia. And I think it was clear since the beginning that we we had to strictly uh, so sort of very very closely align on what we wanted to do, what we wanted to achieve uh, within Concordia and beyond Concordia, what we wanted to do for the cybersecurity community in Europe. Um, Concordia had this concept of ecosystems, and then uh, cyber threat intelligence needed to be part of this ecosystem. And this is where we started thinking to the uh, cyber threat intelligence topic 
as a, as a platform. And I will tell you, of course, more about this, but uh, really trying to build uh, a central point of contact within Concordia for all services related to threat intelligence. Uh, since this is this was the, the starting point, and and we uh, started shaping what uh, we are now discussing today in terms of the Concordia platform for threat intelligence. And I would say uh, just briefly a couple of properties, characteristics, or at least the, the, the guidelines of this uh, um, of, of this platform. Well, first of all. Uh, we're talking about a virtual platform. So uh, we have several solutions and, and you will see, I mean, I, I'm gonna talk more about MIST and threat sharing. Christian will talk more about incident, uh, um, uh, sharing information about incidents. And so, um, um, and, and uh, again, in the, in the next talk, you will see about the DOS and what happens when sharing uh, the DOS signatures. So uh, the idea is we had several uh, kinds of data, several solutions. We wanted to kind of bound all these solutions together. Uh, this is why we, we are not seeking for a one solution to rule them all. Uh, it's more about integrating solutions together and, and, and providing services out of the solution. And this requires a lot of, uh, I would say, compatible models and structures in the background. So trying to understand how we can share information internally, share data internally among those solutions. Uh, and uh, this is where we can discuss and maybe we're gonna discuss in the in the um, uh, next part of the talk also about the standards that, have, that exist for threat intelligence. And finally, uh, I mean, the, the, there was this idea of having this uniform engagement rules. And I think this is the core topic for today, because uh, what I was discussing before is about solutions, it's about technical integration. And then we, we were aware that we needed something more to really engage the partners and to explain to the partners what we should be, what, what the Concordia platform of third intelligence was and how they could access and what it would happen when they are sharing data and so on. And this is what we started discussing together with Dimitra, with Arthur, uh, the code of engagement. Um, so I, this was just a very brief description about the platform uh, and the Siemens specifically uh, is, is responsible for the threat sharing. Then what we decided to use uh, was, was MISP. And uh, MISP is a quite, uh, quite known platform, especially in Europe. Uh, has been around since 2011, and this is this is an open source platform uh, developed by the Computer uh, uh, Incident Response Center in Luxembourg. Um, so uh, this platform is basically providing you a, a trustworthy way to uh, share information about threats, and I mean. Uh, at the, at the beginning, this was really about malware and malware analysis. Been, since then, this evolved uh, a lot. And now MISP is a quite complex environment with which you can do several things. You can, you can store, you can analyze, uh, you can export and import different kinds of formats and so on. I'm just going to stop here uh, by saying that MISP is, uh, as, as mentioned, a very uh, widely known tool to uh, bound the communities that want to uh, share threat intelligence. And this was for sure one of the core components of the platform for threat intelligence we are building up. And with this, I will also give the opportunity to Christian to, to tell more about the incident clearing out. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> um... So maybe, uh, yes, first of all, to go a little bit into the um, incident clearinghouse um, part of the Concordia platform. Um, the incident clearinghouse is sort of uh, complementary, in my view, to what um, MISP is doing, especially inside of the platform. While, as Marco already described, um, 
uh, myth is about sharing indicators. So sharing stuff um, that you need to look out for in your um, sensors, in your monitoring, in your network, um, things that might come your way, attacks that might come your way, um, things that you might find that indicate that you already have a problem in your network. And the complementary part to that is um, what we do with the incident clearing house is that we share information on things that already were recognized in your network. So um, for example, if we have something like a sinkhole for a botnet where um, a researcher or um, a, a data collector assert, um, took over a command and control server and thus collects the information on all the bots being part of that network and connecting to the, um, to the command and control server, um, you can use that information to inform the owners of the networks where all these bots are sitting, that they have a problem in their network. There is already compromised machines running bot software so they can um, go to these machines and mitigate um, and clean up the, the systems. So um, that's, that's exactly the part that the uh, incident clearing house is about. And I think uh, exactly this example of a botnet is a perfect example because you would share the IP um, or the information on the command and control server via MISP to let people know, look out for connections to this part of the network. Um, it signifies, it indicates that you have a problem in your network and you would send all the bot information to the incident clearing house and therefore notify all the registered partners um, that already have bots running in their network that they have a problem. So this is the complementary view on the um, on, on MISP sharing indicators and on the incident clearing house uh, sharing incidents. And um, this works by partners, uh, members of the incident clearing house registering their networks there so that the incident clearing house as the um, central instance there knows who to notify um, if something is detected in, in some of the um, connected networks. And this can be attacks on honeypots, this can be um, Log-in attempts into some kind of services. This can be firewall events. This can be botnet uh, bot infections, as I already mentioned. Um, but uh, you can also put something like um, scans in there, um, scans for DDoS amplifiers, scans for um, existing SSL vulnerabilities, like we had uh, something like uh, two or three years ago, where a couple of these came up. Um, and the interesting part compared to other data collections that you can use to obtain that kind of information is that with the incident clearing house, the members can also submit their information. So um, if they have some sensor running, if they have some uh, events collected in their firewall of, of login attempts uh, or attempts to connect to a certain um, services that they do not offer to the world, um, then they can feed that information to the clearinghouse. Thus, if you receive data from the incident clearinghouse, you get access to sensors, in, a, in essence, that you usually do not get access to because they are not part of a data collection um, company or organization that supplies their own sensors. And um, the incident clearinghouse uh, was developed previously in the um, ACDC European project. So um, this is something that, that we brought into this project, into Concordia, which was already existing before and is already operational and especially connected to the um, European CERT community. So if we have information going into the clearinghouse, then already that information can be received by um, most of the European certs um, so they uh, can clean up the networks that they are responsible for. Now, the additional um, benefit uh, that we see with this um, Concordia platform for threat intelligence is what already Marco um, mentioned, this having a network, having an ecosystem of different solutions being connected together and thus having close integrations between the different parts. So that information that we have in MISP and information that we have in the incident clearinghouse and information that we have in the DDoS clearinghouse can be 
integrated um, and can reference and inform the information in the other platforms. And that's really the, the opportunity that we have here with, um, first of all, the, the technical integration of the different components and then also with the organizational integration, so the code of engagement. Now, the challenges with these kinds of, of endeavors is, um, first of all, for every platform, I think it's the same, it's obtaining data, because everybody likes to obtain data, but few people like to share data. Um, that's, that's always a challenge. Um, and as always, building the technology is usually not hard. Um, there are some problems that you have to solve, but uh, these are more or less all already solved somewhere. So um, just, just building a platform is not that difficult. The challenge comes when um, you have to define workflows and you have to de define um, policies, uh, how people can access the platform. Um, how people can obtain data from the platform, how people can share data with the platform. And um, as I said, uh, all these platforms only work if, if there is data and especially in, in this kind of, of platform, it only works if, if people are sharing data. So um, yeah, therefore the, the, the code of engagement is, is, is really a necessary step to, to get this whole thing flying. Thank you for uh, this initial contributions from from your side. I would like to uh, to take the discussion on a higher level, and uh, we, we talk here about uh, trust, about uh, information sharing, about communities. But if, if even irrespective of Concordia Threat Intelligence uh, Platform. Uh, Sharing is not to be taken for granted. It's not for nothing, even in uh, in the physical world within communities. It's not uh, it's not by coincidence that English language has phrases like uh, sharing is daring or sharing is caring. Uh, so it, it, even in the off offline world, uh, not to mention in this sensitive area of of cyber security. So. Uh, we, this is something acknowledged within the community, of course, of, of cybersecurity experts. And the idea was uh, within Concordia was to to create uh, um, a, 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 an organizational tool. Allow me to put, to put it like this: that would foster engagement with this community. So, uh, bearing that in mind. Um, we were very careful with this, even with the, the selection of the terms of how we're going to uh, address this um, th this code. So we opted for a dynamic code of engagement for trusted threat intelligence sharing. Uh, first of all, we, we, we speak about uh, a code of engagement. Uh, we don't speak about a code of conduct, uh, and this was deliberately done in the sense that this code forms the outcome of a bottom-up approach. It doesn't have a, an instructive role to uh, um, to educate the community what sh it should do, but it comes from members of the community, experts of the community, uh, and how um, aiming to, to see how we foster engagement within its own members. Uh, this 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 code is meant to be dynamic, and this is the case for two reasons. Uh, first of all, um, we all know uh, how rapidly evolving cybersecurity is, and this is uh, bearing that in mind that the code of engagement is not meant to be a static. Um, a, a static code. On, on the contrary, and this is also explicitly mentioned in one of the clauses of the current version of the code, that is meant to be updated. Second, the second reason uh, for which we opted for a dynamic code of engagement is that uh, this code puts forward um, uh, the, a principle-based approach when it comes to information sharing. What do I mean by that? Uh, the code does not provide for uh, very tight rules. On the contrary, it sets certain principles when it comes to data sharing, and the, the, the rationale behind that is to allow its members to deploy the, the to choose for the means uh, through which they are going to implement this uh, this principles uh, in practice. So at the initial phase of this of this code, um, when we we we, we made uh, when by all contributors to the code an initial assessment of the topics to be discussed uh, uh, was made. Um, 
uh, privacy, security, accountability, transparency, were, were uh, amongst the baseline principles uh, to uh, agreed upon that would be reflected on the particular uh, on the particular clauses of the of the code. Uh, so I would like to to uh, ask again, uh, to go back to our uh, panelists and uh, ask you to share with us um, how we came uh, to have the code of engagement, um, the, the current version uh, as we speak, we, which were the initial steps taken uh, by MISP, uh, and I would like uh, Marco to elaborate on that, and, uh, and then uh, Within uh, within instant clearing house, and I would like uh, Christian to elaborate on that when it comes to the initial work that preceded the the current version of the code. Yes. Um, so I mean, when we started this discussion, uh, there were a lot of topics, and uh, some of them were eventually, I think, taken into the hands of also other partners within Concordia. And for example, I'm thinking about like. Uh, the the aspect related to teaching security and then to explaining security um, and so on. I mean, we have a lot of activities there, and and this helps already to uh, foster further collaboration and eventually in our specific context context uh, foster the, the the sharing of information. Um, I think the the the, the part we were the most interested was was creating trust and uh, another related concept that was really creating an incentive also uh, so christian was mentioning this i mean without data we don't go anywhere i would say uh i would say this is fundamental of course I, I, but i i want to stress the fact that uh, collecting data is, is not enough of course and then uh there is an important very important topic in we, that we could, for example, also did today is about making this actionable uh, because it's, it's having data that I cannot access uh, or I, I can access, but I cannot understand that does nothing. Um, but anyway, I would say the, the building trust uh, and, and uh, creating some incentive for, for data sharing, that was the very starting point. And uh, as we said, that was not necessarily a technical issue. Uh, that was related to understand what are the rules um, that we can establish together, uh, the, the, the rules we can share uh, before sharing the data that allow us to collaborate on this topic. And, and this was the, the, the first discussion, this was the first challenge. And then this challenge, uh, we, we decided to tackle this challenge with the code of engagement and the code of engagement. I, I like uh, the, the dynamic part, uh, as Dimitra, you, you very well pointed out. I mean, uh, the discussion is still ongoing uh, and uh, we don't have everything figured out, but we started with this code of engagement to set down, to sit down and, and, and really uh, lay down a set of uh, rules that we can all agree on how this cooperation should work what it means to share what is the information we want to share and uh, and why we think it is important to share that information or not what happens when somebody share information that is not correct or is just not uh comprehensible for uh for the other partners uh what happens when um a partner decides not to share anymore. I mean, all these things, all these questions were, were discussed. Some of them are still under discussion, but having this on paper allows all the partners to be participants of this discussion and eventually agree on, on what we want to do. Christian, would you like to share a couple of thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so um, I think uh, um, uh, first of all, yes, uh, of course, um, having having data or better yet having information, um, because 
we want to have to to, to uh, go a level above that and have have meaning, meaningful data so information that we can really use to do something um, is is fundamental to all this and um, there's a uh, there's also work in in other parts of concordia going on on um, how to incentivize um, people to share information and therefore to to improve that side of the equation um that it, it's always um kind of interesting to see the the different cultures at work there because um me coming from from dfn cert so from the third of the german nren um uh, the CERT community has been sharing uh, data, has been sharing information for for decades. Uh, this is this is essentially what we do, uh, or at least a large part of it. Um, and and uh, there is always this uh, building a better world mentality in there. So we share because we want to improve the network. Um, but uh, of course, there's different cultures, there's different motivations, there's different situations. Um, and you somehow have to to um, combine these and get them them together and share a, share the same picture. Um, going uh, uh, starting with with what we had previously and arriving at this code of engagement. Um, uh, as I said, as we've been sharing information for for decades, essentially, um, this is not the first project that we've been part of where we had to come up with some kind of definition of how to share and how to organize the sharing part of such a project uh, of such a um, yeah such a project um, and also in the um, ACDC project uh, we defined workflows and policies to access uh, of course only the incident clearing house um, because that was the the sharing platform uh, coming out of that project uh, therefore going into the discussion on the code of engagement um, and this was also valid for the for the DDoS clearing house there were pre-existing um, documents, pre-existing policies, pre-existing procedures um, that defined how you could access these parts of the platform and uh, what you have to, what you can expect from the platform and also what you have to comply with to get access to the platform. So uh, who can take part? Uh, there's different um, groups um, in some cases of, of members for the for the incident clearing house in the in the ACDC project there were different stakeholders defined that have different interests in what kind of data they want to obtain from the platform and therefore um, what they have to what rules they have to follow and um, also how they are identified uh, because um, this is also a bit of a specialty for the incident clearing house compared with MISP, for example. Um, in MISP, essentially, the information that you share is um, not, not I, I don't want to say public, but it's essentially you share it for everybody. You can define, I only want to share this with this group, or I only want to share this with this organization. Um, but essentially, you are sharing information to a large group of, of recipients. Um, with the incident clearinghouse, as the focus is on sharing information with the owner of the affected network resources, uh, we are only sharing with one recipient. We are sharing with the one recipient that is responsible for the network. And as we are usually sharing um, mainly IP addresses on compromised machines, so we are directly in the field of personal um, identifiable information. Um, therefore, we also, in this case, have to be kind of strict and define very closely who really is the person or the organization that is allowed to obtain that information. And therefore, we have, depending on the platform, different levels of, of trust that we have to um, attain in order to share information with somebody. Um, yes, so uh, we, we might have different interests from, from different um, groups of stakeholders in there and um, therefore also the rules of, um, of, of access that we have for the incident clearing house and we have for the DDoS clearing house and uh, we have for, for ideas on how we want to deal with MISP, 
um, have to be compatible somehow with each other or we have to, to lay them side by side and look how we can integrate them. And uh, therefore, uh, the, the, the good start for us was that we do not have to start from scratch because we have uh, some pre-existing roadmaps and pre-existing um, working rules uh, that that um, came out of the of the previous project, but uh, of course that is on the other hand a challenge because um, you cannot just uh, start with a clean slate and say okay so everybody that's using the platform uh, now we have just new rules that you have to follow, but uh, we have to see how we can make these um, rules compatible. How can we integrate them, and thus. Um, come to a, to, a, to a set of rules that um, everybody gets behind. Uh, and uh, that is the reason why we also were pursuing this endeavor um, is, uh, and this goes back to incentives for, for data sharing and uh, the sustainability and the, the uh, chances of the platform being realized is if you have three different platforms with three different uh, access conditions, um, which is just the core components of the platform, uh, then the chances of, of somebody joining that and joining this, this ecosystem is quite small because you have three documents that you have to read. You have, uh, you have three um, more or less contracts that you have to sign up to, and this really won't fly. Um, especially if we follow this vision uh, that uh, you, Marco, previously described um, with the platform being an ecosystem and uh, being built on these three main pillars, these three core components that we have, and uh, then having the vision of, of additional services being built on top of that. Um, so we have to, uh, th there really was a need to, to arrive at some construct that is uh, that, that works for all the components and works for the whole ecosystem. Uh, thank you both of you also for this um, follow-up uh, intervention. I would like just to comment on a couple of, of points you touched upon. Um, you both spoke about uh, creative incentives. This gives me an, an, a nice opportunity to discuss a bit about the nature of this code, uh, also to clarify it to, to the attendance of the session. Uh, so this this code forms um, an instrument of self-regulation. So it's not uh, a, a mandatory in the sense of a government, a state-imposed regulation, but it forms the outcome of, of an initiative of the uh, of, of the community. Um, a soft as being a, a soft law instrument, being um, a code of engagement, uh, allows for flexibility, but uh, also, it, it, it's a proactive, uh, proactive um, stance of, of, of the community uh, and it, it can maybe in the future facilitate uh, when it comes to uh, further regulations, mandatory regulations that, uh, that would impose uh, data sharing. Um, second, uh, by, being, uh, by forming the outcome of this of a community, it creates it, it, it's in itself uh, an instrument of, of awareness within the the uh, organization participating in it, and uh, it, it it can uh, that again it's not imposed, but it comes from the members of of the community, and of course the. the it, it's largely based on expertise uh, that may not be there if that code of engagement had a different form and would be, uh, for example, an outcome only strictly of work of, uh, of, of policy makers. Um, I would like us now within the time that we have to focus more on the on the on the current status of the of the code. So the code of engagement um, covers uh, first of all explains uh, what the Co uh, Concordia platform threatened uh, for threat intelligence sharing does uh, it explains also the the uh, what's the the uh, the reasons and the benefits for joining uh, uh, it provides for concrete clauses on how keeping uh, up to date uh, it provides also for obligations and rights for its members such as confidentiality um, or uh, who is responsible in case something goes wrong uh, in, in relation to the content provided in, in the platform uh, and also also, it provides for a, a governance mechanism. 
mechanism, uh, including a dispute resolution within its members. So as we speak, to give you an example as to the latter point, uh, we have a, a steering committee uh, composed of, of four members. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, this is uh, the, the, that's the uh, and the preferable option is if there is any um, uh, any issues occurring that this is uh, this is solved amicably without, uh, of course, uh, while also the there is possibility to take measures such as uh, cease and desist or, or other um, or other measures in accordance with the applicable uh, regulations. Um, now, um, reflecting on the on the current state of the of, of play of the code of, of, the, of the status of this code, which, by the way, it's a rolling release and it will be part of a publicly available uh, document of a deliverable of Concordia, me, namely the third year uh, threat in intelligence uh, report. Uh, on, on no, forgive me, I should correct that on the th the third year. Um, uh, threat landscape report, which is due in uh, uh, end of this December, uh, the, the code will be part of this. Uh, the current version of this code be part of this deliverable. Uh, so, bearing in mind what has been already covered with that, I would like our uh, uh, panelists to to share with us uh, uh, part uh, points of the code that you think are areas that could be uh, further improved or what or to put it uh, to put it in a similar way which are the how what is your opinion on the current uh, um, version of the code and which would be the next steps to, to take marco do you like to start yeah so uh as you said, this is a rolling release, and, and uh, some of the discussions are still ongoing. And uh, again, I will just briefly go back to the point on, on the interrelationship between the, uh, the the need of having goods and uh, incentivizing the use of the sharing. Uh, I don't know, and uh, definitely not a legal expert here. When, when there is a talk about obligations and things. Uh, this is usually uh, tricky for for companies, especially. Um, and uh, I think it is important to 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 stress once more that the code of engagement was coming out of a need, not something that we wanted to to decide because uh, we want to uh, play with our own rules. So. Uh, we needed to have something written down and we needed to have a set of rules because the uh, even the partners that, that want to share want to know what happens to that so there is definitely no um no, no negative aspects in terms of we want to oblige uh, partners to do something specific it's really about uh building trust by having such uh, such rules, and uh, uh, Dimitri, you were asking about the the what, what which part are still uh, open. Um, maybe I will I will point out one uh, that uh, that I find particularly important, and it's about uh, the kind of data uh, because I mean this is of course a discussion we had already. Uh, point is that when we talk about threat intelligence. Uh, and especially, so my part on threat intelligence sharing, uh, we give it for granted that we are sharing indicator of compromises while the amount of information you can share is the, the amount of the, the, the types of information you can share are, are numerous. And, and Christian has already explained, he has a different perspective because it's uh, not defined about incidents, so the information is different. And one thing that Siemens is particularly looking into is uh, causes of action. And so like playbooks with which you uh, resolve a, a, an incident or can, for example, respond to a threat. And that means sharing information about how a company plan to defend itself against the threat. And that is tricky because then you are telling something about your own company or you might be telling some, uh, something for uh, about your company 
uh, and this needs to be uh, well addressed because then at that point the, the the kind of rules may change the kind of way we handle the data may change this is definitely uh, a, a, an open discussion and should enter within the within the code of engagement thank you marco christian Yes, maybe <clears throat> just just directly um, commenting on that because um, uh, that is not really about the the code of engagement, but I think that is something that highlights uh, also why this platform and this integration of services is, is is promising or provides some some opportunities that that are really worth um, uh, trying to to integrate this because um, if you look at uh, exactly this sharing of of playbooks, sharing of um, causes of action that you do to address some kind of threat. Th this is again something that you want to share with with everybody out there. So this is something that um, is, is is naturally um, useful for for a kind of platform such as MISP. Um, but but here again, if we uh, manage, and this is something that that we are also working on in parallel. If we manage to connect um, incidents like we are sharing with the incident clearing house, with these courses of action that are shared, uh, that can be shared via MISP, for example, then we have the opportunity to to link these platforms. And um, in the instance that we inform somebody of problems that they have in their network. Uh, we might be able to already say, uh, okay, and by the way, this is how other people address this and uh, this might be interesting for you or this might be um, uh, information valuable for you to, um, to define your own response to that, to that threat. So I think this is, this is also something that is really um, promising for, for the integration of the platforms. Um, as for the state of the um, code of engagement right now, I think uh, we are at a, a good point um, also uh, with the um, with the plans of, of uh, including it into uh, one of this year's deliverables. Um, we have a, a quite solid foundation for, for an integrated um, document on the uh, rules and um, on, the, on, the, on the frame that we're working in, so to say. Um, what I think uh, will be um, is still something that, that we have to work on or that we have to discuss is, um, as I mentioned previously, we have for these different platforms um, different um, expectations or different limits on things that we can do or cannot do. So, um, uh, for example, for the incident clearing house, we have to make sure that somebody that registers to that platform or that registers networks to that platform network resources is really the one that uh, is legally allowed to obtain information on that network. Um, therefore, we will have um, limits, rules, policies that are um, not applicable to all parts of the platform, but that are really applicable to some parts of the platform. And um, I think we still have to, to find a good way to integrate um, this information into our framework um, to not uh, uh, arrive in the end at the code of engagement uh, for people to sign up to, and then individual regulations for all our core platforms. Uh, so not reducing the number of documents that you have to uh, follow, but increasing them by one. Um, uh, and I think that's that's still something that we have to, to address. Um, uh, as for a um, outlook on what I think will be interesting is um, how will this work if we um, go forward to this vision of an ecosystem and uh, arrive at new services to be integrated into the platform. Um, because at that point, uh, we have to see um, if, if the new service does not come with any rules attached, then that might be quite easy because uh, then the service can probably just latch on to what we have there. Um, if the new service introduces its own limitations or its own um, special rules, then uh, it, um, it will be interesting to, to see how um, this can be integrated. Uh, I think with the definition of the uh, code of engagement as a living doc document and also with this um, sort of update mechanism being integrated into the rules, 
um, the, the the framework is there to deal with that. But um, it will be interesting to see uh, whether that works out or not. Um, at least for us, uh, it's it's the first time that we uh, try to go down this road. Um, so yeah, it will be interesting to see how that works out. Um, but I think uh, with the with the setup that we have, this is an uh, interesting blueprint uh, for how to approach these kinds of, of integrations of platforms and these kinds of sharing communities um, and ecosystems uh, that might be available, uh, that might be usable or, or, or useful for, for other projects as well. Um, as I said, uh, the, the um, building the technology, or as, as Marco already, uh, already also said, uh, building the technology is usually easy but um, defining the the policies and and rules of access is usually more challenging, and there is uh, not many projects that bring the expertise on both sides. So, um, uh, in that regard, the code of engagement can also possibly serve as a blueprint for other projects to to use. Thank you both. Um... We are about to run out of time. I would like to ask whether there, um, they are, there are any questions from the attendance of this session to be addressed to our panelists. I don't see any questions on the chat, unless of course um, there is anything I'm missing out on. All right, um, then uh, perhaps we could uh, slowly start uh, closing the session. Um, I would like, first of all, to, to thank uh, our panelists uh, once again, um, Marco Caselli and uh, Christian Keo, uh, the organizers of the session and all these events, uh, Antonio Yanillo and, of course, uh, um, Concordia uh, project hosting uh, this event. Uh, before closing, uh, on my side, I would just like to, to share with you uh, a point raised uh, during the last uh, Concordia meeting by one of Concordia partners uh, involved actually in the work on uh, threat intelligence sharing uh, and um, uh, who actually quoted uh, Aristoteles by saying that uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I believe this is um, relevant both for the work done within Concordia in, in terms of the creation of the Concordia Threat Intelligence Platform, as well as for the code of engagement that we would that we have been discussing today. Um, thank you all for this attention and uh, uh, Antonio, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitra. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Christian. So thank you. we are starting soon.